work and they inspired me to get into it and I went and spent about two hours in his shop and he couldn't have been a nicer gentleman. And we talked a lot about the epoxy finish. He told me, answered every question except whose do you use? <laughs> and they don't want to tell anybody about that, but that's okay. So what I thought I'd do, uh, with that being said, uh, show you a few slides of some of my work that I've done just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, because most of it, I am coating with epoxy. And while that did come a lot from the Molthrop's work, uh, my wife, when I got into the Gasparil Art Show, her comment was, <clears throat> selling an art piece uh, for $400 that you can't do anything with it except look at, you need to do something. So that's when I got thinking about the uh, using the epoxy because then you could put water and flowers in it, cut flowers. So I got doing that and uh, that's a piece of uh, Norfolk Island pine. It was a crotch piece that uh, I guess the color's coming through on that pretty good, but it, it was about uh, 20 inches tall. Oh, great. About 20 inches tall and I sold that at the Winter Park Autumn Fest. Another piece of Norfolk Island pine, and this is one uh, that I actually took this to Frank's Turn and Learn, uh, what, Tuesday night things or whatever, and he looked at it and said, it's gone too far, you'll never get a finish on it. Well, that's the thing about epoxy, uh, and as I'll get into it, putting on a, the first coats when it just soaks in, you can let that dry and then you can finish something. So I can let stuff go a little further because of that, <clears throat> even if it's spalted or whatever. So. And, and that one's, well, let's see, that one's probably about uh, 16 inches in diameter. And this one was a, another crotch piece that had just, I mean, it looked hand painted. Just when I, when I finished this one in, the, in my shop, my wife came out because I was out there high-fiving myself. I was really pleased with it. another piece of Norfolk Island pine. I like Norfolk Island pine. <laughs> I do a lot of these, I call them my cuddlies, they're kind of things you kind of pick them up and uh, you just kind of don't want to put them down and uh, enjoy doing them. This is my only piece from Irma, that's a piece of monkey puzzle and uh, was, I think that one ended up being about 14 inches or so in diameter but the interesting thing was that's where the pith came together, it was kind of off-centered the way the tree was leaning and it, I put a little uh, epoxy with some brass shavings in there and got that flower. Really kind of a neat look. I like turning pine. This is just some old slash pine I got from a friend that's about, uh, oh, 18 inches tall. Uh, what, 10, 11 inches in diameter. Uh, another piece of pine. That one's probably about a 12 inches or so in diameter, something like that. And this little little bigger piece but that one was a node, had a lot of, you can kind of see all the feathers in there, really came out great. Piece of uh, camphor, I think everybody's turned camphor. And Rudy Lopez took this picture, and I've got to tell you, the, the camphor color was not quite that, but so, so be it. Another, uh, this is another camphor crotch that, uh, again, you can see the feather and the grain on it is just amazing. And all of these are coated with epoxy. Another, that was a three, three-way uh, branching off section that uh, kind of looks like a fish. And found some uh, box elder. But this was, this is some that had spalted. And uh, again, it was, it was just about to go. And uh, the, the first coat of epoxy kind of brought it back to where I could sand it and get rid of all the tear out. It's from the same log. Another piece of uh, camper. I like leaving the natural edges on. Kind of give you a sense of the tree. That's one of my favorite pieces. That's about 10 inches around. But just camper just always has such beautiful grain. This piece of uh, cedar. I got a call from a friend of mine who was taking down a tree uh, over in Ybor City. It was at a convent. I didn't even know we had a convent over there. And uh, got this piece. And it's about 30 inches tall. And uh, just to give you a sense of how big it was. And uh, hollowed that out. Another piece of cedar. 
cedar. Oop, let me go back. But that was a friend called me about it, taking down a mango tree uh, in his yard, and that sat for about eight months, I guess, and just got wonderfully spalted. And that's some, um, again, the epoxy kind of saved it. Uh, I just kept letting it go, and I mean, it just, you can see just unbelievable spalting going on in it. You're doing the art shows, <clears throat> just something else I started doing. People come in, you don't do pet urns? No, don't do pet urns. You don't do pet urns? No. Well, I started doing pet urns. Nobody's asked about them since. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got them, <laughs> if you're ready. Uh, and then sinks, uh, y'all may have seen them over here. I've, that's something I got doing when we moved in the house where we downsized. Had a pretty large house and we'd raised our two boys and it was a defensive mover, move to make sure they didn't come home again. But uh, my younger son did and brought his fiance. But uh, anyway, that's been about five years and now we have a little granddaughter there so it's working out well. This piece of uh, monkey pod and that's turned uh, side grain. That's uh, monkey pod turned uh, end grain. And those are a couple of rosewood sinks. That's both sides of the log. Uh, so it's kind of a quote-unquote matched pair. Uh, Norfolk Island pine. Now, I'll tell you, I've, I have sold a lot of the Norfolk Island pine sinks. Uh, people come into my booth at the show and get them. Uh, I'll have some follow-up people come back. Uh, and I called, two ladies bought them, separate shows and all that, and I just stay in touch. I want a picture of the sink installed. One of them's got it hanging on the wall, and the other one said, no, we can't use it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay, uh, and this one, the, uh, the mate to it's over here. This is a piece of uh, pecan that got eaten by the, uh, the worms, and so they worked harder on it than I did. But a uh, fella uh, bought this one. You can see through it, and if you look at the one over on the table, uh, it's just got eaten up, and I had a very low-tech way of getting the epoxy in there. But a uh, little camphor sink. And that's it. But just to give you a sense of the kind of stuff I'm doing, uh, I think what I want to do now, and we'll see how this goes, I, this is my third, no, this is my fourth demonstration, Frank, I lied to you, it's fourth. So we'll see how it goes, but the two things I wanted to talk about, obviously the hollowing in uh, this system, Major, where are you? This is, uh, Major and I ran into each other, uh, what, over a year ago at the uh, Atlanta AAW. We were both buying the Clark hollowing system, and I've just really been impressed with it. Uh, it's all uh, chrome molly steel, hard. The interesting thing, the slide, I thought it really, at first I thought it had some kind of linear bearing in it, but it doesn't. Uh, a little little spot of uh, WD-40, just wipe it down with that, and it just really keeps it lubricated. But the other thing, you know, with the D-handles, you've got, you know, a lot to deal with back here. And this gives you the flexibility to really move around. You can slide this further over. <clears throat> and I don't know that you can see this. Well, you hadn't got to, I moved again. <laughs> As you get back on that camera, I don't know if you can zero in to see this. <laughs> well, anyway, this part of it, if you look at this shaft, it's been machined out so there's a flat spot and there's a bearing here that everything rides on, which makes it tremendously smooth when you're, when you're working deep hollowing. Uh, I've got the same system. I've, I work on a Nova 20 inch lathe and uh, keep talking to Frank C about an even swap, but he hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, but uh, it does a great job. And I consistently go 26, 27 inches deep with this. And they do make, uh, calls it a fulcrum. And it, it wouldn't fit on this because the, the banjo is so high. But this would go up here, and what all this is, <clears throat> you would, the tube would go through there, and this gives you that thickness, like almost a half inch more of metal uh, support when your bar is hanging out over, the, uh, over your tool rest. 
So when you're really getting deep, uh, I haven't got deep enough that I, like I said, 26, 27 inches. I haven't really gone any deeper than that. I think with this, if I really planned another project right, but on my inch lathe, I'm, that's about all the backup I've got. So this is another thing that they do make, which I'm sure would be a help because that's a lot of metal to give you more support as you're getting out over your tool rest. But the uh, tips and all, Keith Clark, who, who makes this, is actually an ENT, and when I call him and if a lady answers, it's a nurse because he's in surgery, but he is just passionate about machining. And uh, he made this one for me, and I made this one. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just love hollowing, and uh, I'm dangerous. I built myself a little forge and bend some things. But the cutting tip that I use, too, where are you? Okay. Is, it's the Proform cutter made in Australia. Uh, it's wood cut, and I've just been really pleased with it. Uh, Raleigh Monroe has one that's very good. That I know Rudy Lopez loves it. Uh, it clogs. This will clog up a little bit, but I've just gotten really uh, to where I like this, and it will peel off shavings even on, and we'll work on this one in a minute. This is a piece of rosewood that I kind of wanted to do something to bring down today that uh, we could demonstrate this a little bit. After I started to turn, I realized it was dead dry and I didn't have time to make a change. But you'll see that it really does pull off sh shavings. But just a, another quick aside, making my tools, when I'm doing some of the little pieces, I made this rig, uh, just half inch bar, Home Depot, three eighths inch bar, bought a little laser, and uh, sometimes the laser works, there it is. But this is something just to do the little pieces to get in there. <coughs> can do them very quickly. A lot of the, as I call them, my little cuddlies. And I've also made this in a 5 8 inch bar that I can get a little deeper. But I start off usually just without the laser. And when I get close to the sides, I get in and then start finishing it out. But a lot of things you can do. Just something I enjoy doing with, uh, with all the hollowing. But... <coughs> Back to this, and you know, we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time hollowing. It's kind of about the most boring thing in the world to watch. But uh, I just wanted to show how this works. Uh, that Proform cutter, which I've got on here, and we, yeah, same, same cutter. And again, this is just dead dry. Uh, the laser, I'm not using that because the way the plug is is just kinda, and we're not gonna get that tight that we need it, but uh, it's also the, the steady rest is made by uh, Clark and with it canted off to the right it really makes some great room uh, for the, the laser to get through there. But this cutter likes to have an edge here, fulcrum, really just to push on it. And I think you'll see that it really does. I don't know how many RPM I'm going, Frank. Where are you? That looks about right. They, that might be a little fast. They tell you about 600 RPM is what they like. Like I said, this is just dead dry. Now I drilled, I drilled a three quarter inch hole all the way. But I think you can tell from the shavings, the shavings flying out, it's, it's cutting. Cutter, when, once you get it positioned, as you can see, this one it's cocked over a little bit to get that leading edge. Uh, it it gets after it and it'll, and it'll pull it all out. Like I said, the the, the shaking there just gotta wait and pick up the cut.
I don't have to clean up, do I, Frank? Just in that length of time, I've probably gotten down a, another inch or so. Another thing I like about this tool is the way you can bring it back and just set it on the ground. And everything's out of the way. Yeah, kind of gotten back about another, another inch or so. But what I usually do in drilling my holes, uh, you can tell that little shaking. I start off with this, and I start with a pretty high speed and just move this in very slowly until I can get that centered up. And then this with the Morris taper on it into the quill or the, the tailstock. And so I can get, you know, pretty deep with that. And what I have done with this, it's probably not according to Hoyle, but it works. This is three quarter, this is three quarter. Put it in there when I get really deep and get it centered and pick up the hole again and get get deeper with that. It works and uh, with a little practice you can you can get there. But any questions? Boy, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> uh, but a couple other things about it. The the uh, top of this. You know, is for as you can imagine, it's pretty heavy as it's coming back. And this is the the four foot. You can also get a five foot, uh, which if you're really going deeper. But this is kind of a a great safety thing to pull it back that far, and then you can put it up, get your laser aimed. And, and again, this is not set up because of the plug. We really couldn't do it. But uh, it's a glad you asked that. You know, I, I've sold a lot of pieces in, in, a, in a fairly short time. Nobody's ever asked me how thin it is. I kind of turn it till I'm tired of turning and it looks about right. That's, yeah, that's, that's uh, about where it is. Uh, I'm, I try to stay pretty consistent and, and quite frankly, I've picked up, you know, John Muscal. I mean, unbelievable, beautiful work. You pick it up, it's, it's very light. And that's what he does. Uh, I heard a term years ago when I was in the furniture business, they were talking about a table on rollers and it just had a lot of weight to it. And they said, that piece has authority. So my piece have authority. <laughs> and I like that. But, you know, huh? Uh, I might even go three eighths or a half. I, it just depends on, on how heavy it is. You know, Norfolk Island pine is so light to begin with and dries. I might leave that half inch. Um, this, something a little more than maybe five sixteenths or so. Uh, it, it just kind of varies. And the other thing uh, I do a lot of times that causes me to leave it a little thicker, and this one doesn't really show it, this one a little bit, but you can see there's a, a little uh, natural edge right there. I like leaving that. Kind of gives you a sense of the, the tree. And when I do that, like on that uh, cypre, uh, cedar piece I showed you, that was a really deep one. And that one, I'm, I just barely broke into that and it's probably an inch thick at the bottom. You know, and uh, actually the, when I first started going to Tri-County Woodturners when I was just learning about stuff. I forgot who it was said if you're going to if you're going to try to turn things for other wood turners, you're never going to have success. <laughs> so, you know, I I just get them to where I like them and uh, and let it go. I, I obviously you need to get them consistently thick when they're drying, but uh, not a whole lot. Anyway, this I, I think you've probably seen enough of the hollowing. It you just keep going, and uh, if somebody wants to stay here tonight, I'll hollow it on Frank's and save my machine. But uh, once, once I get it uh, turned, like this has it on a, uh, obviously on a, uh, what do you call these things? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, face plate, which uh, I use that a good bit. But what, uh, generally what I do is, is I'll just chuck it up. Now this is one that came off and I'll use my bigger chuck with a bigger tenon 
to get it turned to this diameter. And then once it's to there, and this one might be a little over, maybe three eighths or so thick, pretty consistent. Once I get it there, I'm not concerned with as big a tenon. So what I'll do, you know, the, an art piece, uh, you always want a thinner base. So I'll turn it down to a smaller tenon. And uh, that lets me make it smaller. And then when it, as we get into the finishing, uh, I've got plenty to attach uh, my mount to it. But once I get it turned uh, and it dries, as this one has, and I'm ready to, to, I'll finish sand it, and then I'll go around and I'll start looking. There's cracks. Anybody ever had a crack in something they turned? Yeah. Uh, and what I'll do is take my epoxies and decide what I'm going to do. And I'll use this super bond. I don't know. If get in trouble for selling somebody else's epoxy. I know they sell West Systems here, but uh, I've been working for years with uh, the folks at uh, Fiberglass Coatings up there, great people, and they used to sell West Systems. Uh, it's a great system. I've just been using this, but this is a two-part thing, one-to-one -one mix, and it's kind of like Vaseline when you get it all put together, and it's a yucky, Vaseline-y looking color. But this is a gap-filling epoxy that once you get it all mixed up, I mean, you can, you wouldn't believe what the holding power of this. Uh, I've, I've used it on some slabs before and it, it just flat holds. It takes a while to set up. I think the quickest stuff, this stuff sets up in about 30, 45 minutes. Uh, they've got some slower setting stuff. Just depends on what you're doing. But then uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. The dyes you can get and you don't want them leaking. And there's one thing you especially don't want. Ah, oh, thank you. And don't ask me how I know this, but you don't ever want to drop them on the floor because those plastic things will break. And uh, what I'll do, depending on what, here, would you mind holding that for me? No. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of colors that you can get and you just mix them in. Uh, there's a burnt umber that's a great color with camphor. Uh, Black is okay, but what I'll do, there's a, a red uh, color in, well, it doesn't matter. There's a red that you can kind of mix it with some of the, oh, that's right, that's the one I dropped the other day. Uh, but there's a red that you can mix in with the black and uh, really closely match, so you can play with the, the colors and do it. The other thing I like doing is, I showed you that one slide, is this is just brass shavings from uh, a key maker. Don't go to Home Depot. They got all kinds of silver in theirs because of the a lot of aluminum keys and a lot of chrome colored keys. So there's a key shop uh, down on Beta Bay that I stop in and they've got a box. They save it for me. But you can mix this in with this and, and you mix it till you just about can't see the glue. And when you polish it up, it looks like a little jewel in there. Now, I've had people say, well, why don't you use this stuff is so nasty. Uh, why don't you use turquoise? I'm just not a blue guy. Any y'all fill things with turquoise? Not seeing a lot of hands on that either. There's somebody in the back there. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. But uh, that was just a couple drops of that stuff. Um, the, you can do the turquoise or whatever. The other things I've done some and then aluminum powders uh, or p powdered metals. This is this is some aluminum, and I've been amazed that what I can get out of this. I did a couple of pieces, I think they were Red Bay, and they just had some stress cracks that appeared in them, filled them with this. It looked like little lightning bolts going through. Uh, and there's the nickel, silver, uh, brass powder. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Some of this, you can work with uh, CA glue in some of the cracks and it, it gets harder, quicker, and can buff up a little shinier. So once you get that all shiny and you, you get the epoxy on it, you get a real uh, glamour spot. Um, and then the, the squeegees, you know, to get it pressed in, to get in as far as you can. So I'll go through and I'll, I'll do all of that uh, preparation uh, with whatever 
you know, there's little things here and looking at the piece, I might not put black in there because it's close to the knot, maybe mix up a little bit of red. Um, these don't really have a whole lot of big cracks, but uh, I don't know if any of y'all looked at this, but I can pass that one around. That one's got um, the brass in it, which, yeah, which gives a, a, a really a, a neat, neat look. Uh, this one, I don't think I, I might have put a little bit of black in here. But when I'm doing the, I want the surface, I mean the surface, continuous, sanded, even, because it's all going to show any imperfections. So once I've got this to this stage and turn it down, I'll get it back on the lathe, do all the finishing or the, the filling, and the final sanding. So now we're ready, and I'll show you my machine over here. Uh, to get it on the machine. So this, huh? When do you take the foot off? Very last thing. <laughs> this is my Rube Goldberg special. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be able to get it on the screen, but I mentioned the Molthrops when I saw some videos of their work. Uh, it was just. No, wait a minute, I'm right in front of the... There we go. Uh, I saw the, their machine. I sat there with a stopwatch watching a video trying to figure out how many RPM it was turning. I came up with four. And it worked fine when I was doing little pieces. And the bigger pieces I got into, it'd be, I'd feel a little glob on one side or another. And when I met with Philip, I asked him about that. And he said, what RPM are you turning? I said, four. He said, how'd you come up with that? I told him watched a video of his and counted them and he laughed and he said eight is the magic number that they've come up with. So what I do at this stage, this part of the, the apparatus uh, is just a hand wheel and I've got a, a tray here to catch any drippings, that kind of thing. And basically I'll take my not West system stuff. <laughs> what I use is this ultra high, high gloss, ultra clear that I get and they tell me this is what they sell to the surfboard industry. So, you know, you've seen the surfboards, they do unbelievable decorations on them and then come over the top of it with uh, the epoxy. So they want to see it all. So that's the same thing that I want too. So this is a one and a half, uh, one to two mix. So what I do, I buy these little cups and, and this does an amazing amount of it. And all right, give me. You see this kind of matches up with the <laughs> the curve. And what I've done here, I've made some marks. I put one part in here, pour it in, make a mark, and then I put two parts in here, pour it in, make another mark. A lot of times you see people and they're mixing, well, this much in here and pour them together. Well, you still got so much in here, it just seemed wasteful. So with this, I'll just pour it in, get it to whichever mark I'm going through. I've got the green is for a little one, uh, black's for a little bigger one, and then the, the larger amount, and I mix it. So I've got this going. Uh, and by the way, if you want cheap brushes, dollar store. Got a pack of three, I throw them away. I mean, that pack of three for a dollar, 33 cents? Yeah, I'm not cleaning those. Uh, anyway, get it, get it mixed up really well. And the first coat that I put on, I'll take in, and I have to do this when my wife's not home. I go put it in the microwave. And just for like, for a, if that one was full, eight seconds, nine seconds is all it needs. And you take it out and it's warm to the touch. And you've got, three or four minutes to get it put on. Well, that's plenty. So what I'll do, I'll generally start inside, pour some in, and I didn't have any of the brushes to bring tonight, but I'll take, I'll take the brushes and I'll put them in my vise and I'll take the handle out. And then I'll take a piece of coat hanger, stick it in there and clamp it, then I can bend it. So I've got a little brush on a coat hanger and as I get it in there, I can then rotate this and start 
painting the insides because the insides are finished as well as the others. And depending on the size, you can put a whole lot in, roll it around for a while, and then pour it out. But then you need to make sure you get it everywhere, especially up on the shoulders. So I'll do that first and then just paint the outside. And then once I get that done, take it off here onto one of these and there it sits for about an hour and a half to two hours. And what, what I'm wanting to what I'm wanting to get accomplished then is just for it to tack up. I want to be able to kind of and I'll check down here on the bottom to where it's tacky. It's not Hi. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm new at this camera stuff. Um, so once it gets tacky, and I mean, it's not runny tacky, it's just, you know, almost there. You put on another coat, and then you've got a chemical bond that really seals it up. <clears throat> and on Norfolk Island Pine or Monkey Puzzle, which this is, this stuff soaks it up, I mean, like a sponge and it goes in so the first coat is you look back at it and there's nothing there but let it get hard and then you put on the second coat now it's starting to look like something and the third coat it's holy smokes we're there sometimes you get some uh, i was talking with dave the manager here he was saying that every now and then they'll do something and all of a sudden they'll find a void in it that happens if that happens then back to the lathe sand it down fill any spots Put on another coat and that's this one uh norfolk pine, island pine is famous for that but if you can really see this but that this one did that and looked at it and went oh man that's that's just not there so this is what you can get i mean it's darn near you know flawless so once you get those three coats on uh and if you do need to sand it again and um put a fourth coat on that's I've never had to go past that uh, then you end up with with this and this is just about how it came off and I forgot to bring it but Meguiar's makes a compound it's I mean you can't even feel the grit in it and they make that in a polish and I've got a little uh, Milwaukee polisher that I'll put it on and just run that through it. And I mean, it just comes out showroom ready. Uh, somebody asked about the foot. Uh, I'll turn off the foot. After everything is done, I'll reverse chuck it. And I've got the center point in here. I know where that is, so I get it lined up. And I'll turn off the nub and uh, then I'll sand it and just finish it sitting like so. Put a little more epoxy on it, sign it, and we're done. Uh, I don't try to get real fancy with the bottoms. Uh, How are you chucking it? Well, I make a, a jam chuck up here, and then I, it's another thing I need to talk to Frank about. He's got one of those fancy metal things that goes in there with the sliding. Uh, what do you call that thing, Frank? Uh, I got one from Rubber Chucky, but it was threaded, but oh, rubber cone. Rubber cone. What it does, it's a long metal thing, and it's, uh, it's got a Morris taper on one end, so it gets it right in the center. And on something this size, it works pretty good. So you're actually getting your pressure all the way on the bottom. You, if you follow me, it's a, uh, I don't know, but picture this. <laughs> and on one end of it, it's got something. I mean, this is a smooth bar with a Morse taper. Then on one end, you've got a flat surface that has some kind of a sponge, rubber, something that grips the bottom. So when you put, the, put it in, the pressure is on the bottom. So you're not putting pressure on your piece at all. And then you can turn it off. And I'll turn it pretty far off. And then I've got one of those little Japanese narrow saws and I'll saw it off, turn it up and just sand it. But let's just say uh, I've got a piece that's like that cedar piece. Well, I had to make a chuck uh, or a jam chuck that it fit. And I'll take some scrap, put it on, and turn a, uh, a piece that would get, get up in here and kind of form to it. 
And then I'll take carpet uh, pad, not carpet pad, but the no slip carpet grip stuff. And I'll lay a couple layers of that over it and then jam it up there. And you gotta be careful, light cuts. And, but you've got your center here. And generally it's, it's turning very true when I'm doing that. So you go ahead and turn the nub off and then like I say, sand the little bit that's left and, and uh, then you're good. Uh, the other piece, um, those, that first piece I showed you that had the, uh, the clam shape to it. Well, there was no round part at the top. So what I did there, I took a, a, a piece of plywood, cut it round, trued it up. When I, I put it on a, a face plate, put it on the lathe, trued it up. Then I mounted a couple of pieces of two by four, three pieces around it, put another piece of plywood on there, and then rounded that out to a circle that the clam fit into. You follow me on that? So the thing was sitting, you know, the, the piece came up like this and there was nothing round at the top, but as you came down, there was a round part there. There were some voids, but overall you were sitting in a round part. And again, had some packing in there because it, it's finished. You know, I've got epoxy on it and it's done. And put that in there and again, light cuts and just take it off. How long does it take the epoxy to cure? I think say six hours is that once I start with that machine, uh, sometimes I can get eight pieces on there depending on the size, sometimes just four or five. Yeah, but say again? Oh, it's that by the time I'm doing that, I've let it sit for a day or two. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've let it sit. Now, the other thing is, <clears throat> it needs to cure for about two weeks before you put water in it because uh, it will kind of haze over. Doesn't really hurt anything. But uh, I did that on a vase and I looked down in it and went, oh, what's this? But it, you need to let it cure for about a, a week or 10 days. But yeah, no, I, I don't. Once I take it off here, when I've got these things on it, uh, I'll take it off and I've got some holes drilled in the workbench that I put some dowels in. So I'll just sit them there so I can get a good look at them. And I'll leave it sitting there overnight at least. And maybe another day just because you don't want to mess it up. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's hard then when I, when I do it. <clears throat> now the two part epoxy, honestly, uh, when I was doing some boat work, I used a lot of resin, which, you know, you take the resin and it's just a few drops of hardener that really puts out the fumes. And I had to do that outside this, there's an odor to it. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it every day, but uh, it's, it's not anything like the resin. And I have not had any problems with it. I mean, I can smell it, uh, but it's not a heavy, you know, overwhelming uh, smell. And I do have, I got an air conditioner in my garage. I mean, a window unit, and that helps kind of filter it. But I have not had a problem with that. Uh, but I hasten to add that everybody's different and it's like Coca Bolo. Some people can't mess with that stuff. Doesn't bother me, but uh, monkey puzzle, whatever else. But anyway, uh, that and a little soft view. Any more questions? <laughs> but that's what I do. Yes? When you're finishing, are you doing that in another room so you don't have to solve it? You know, I don't. It's, it's just all in the same room. And. Uh, Amazingly, it comes out okay. Uh, the worst thing I've had is uh, one night, a uh, beautiful night, and I had some windows open, left the door of the garage open, just getting a little breeze. Bugs love it. Oh, I was, <laughs> I was ready to. Oh, yeah, I forgot. To <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, thank you. This was one of my great additions. Because the, the one thing is I'm, is I'm putting this on is uh, you got to see uh, the reflection. So I, I made this. So as I'm, as I'm putting, putting the epoxy on over here, I mean, you got to see it. And with the reflections, as it's rotating around, if you've got a void or a, a holiday, as they say, if you've missed a spot, you need to see it. And this, this really helps me. And then generally, if I'm doing a, a big holoform, I've got another uh, little LED light 
mounted over here that's shining in it so I can kind of get a get a handle on what I've done there so then you know as I'm getting done and I'm inspecting the rest of them I can roll it along I got too much time on my hands and you know, I build these things <laughs> but I got looking at it and uh, I, I used to be retired and now I'm a full-time wood turner I guess but uh, I do have uh, you know just as, as I say, I'm sure a lot of y'all haven't never heard of me, and I haven't really heard that much of me. But uh, I've got my stuff in the uh, art, Florida Craft Art Gallery uh, up in St. Pete, which Jim Smith's got some stuff there, maybe some others of you that do. And then uh, I was very fortunate. I mentioned my, my cuddlies I turn, you pick them up, and uh, I was in the Dogwood Arts Festival up in Atlanta, Piedmont Park, and this lady came in and uh, was looking at, I had all those little cuddlies, so you saw that picture with all of them there. And she walked in and looked at me and said, is it okay if I pick those up? I said, well, you'll buy it. She said, I have to buy it if I pick it up. I said, no, but you will. And so she said, okay. She picked it up. And, oh, this is, and, and I don't, I, I, 100 bucks, 150 bucks for some of those. And she just loved it. And then uh, turned out she owned an art gallery and invited me to come meet with her. So I've got my stuff up there and been, been doing reasonably well. And I think some of it is it's in my old hometown. It's in Virginia Highlands area of Atlanta. I grew up in the Druid Hills area, which is right next to it. So very fortunate to have that going for me for only turning a few years and having to learn from guys like Jim Smith and, and uh, Frank and whoever. How do, you, uh, how do you fix little spots where it's uh, dried or where it didn't take? totally uniform all the time uh well i mean if you look at this one there's there's some little spots and things and this one before i discovered the uh, buffing and mcguire's stuff i went to my uh friendly auto repair shop uh and got talking to the guy and he kind of walked me through it so i will i mean if, if it comes out like that and this one i did there were some real not good things in here. And I basically sanded this thing back down and then buffed it all the way back out. I think I sanded it down to maybe started sanding it 1,200, took it back up to 3,000 or 5,000. 5, and then started using that compound and all, and it brings it right out. So if it's really bad, Frank, and it's, I've had one, uh, as my son pointed out, or this piece of monkey pod, and there was a, knot or something here and there was a spot that I thought it was filled but it wasn't it actually went into wood so I had to go back and fill that and, and do it again and it's it's a process and if you look on the other opposite side of this right around the knots you know it's not perfect uh, I just wasn't that worried about the bottom side you just you don't see it you want to talk about your sanding techniques? my sanding uh yeah i i am not at all shy about pulling out my 60 grit gouge uh <laughs> a lot of times with uh, the norfolk island pine uh you got to go back to a pretty good grit uh when i let it go as far as i do sometimes but i'll use the uh, i've got the milwaukee uh it's an angle drill and i use that it's reversible and then I've got, uh, what's it, Wood Turning Wonders, Ken Rizza. Know him, he goes to all the woodworking shows and all. And he sells those pieces, you put it in the chuck and you can unscrew the pad and you've got different grits on each pad. I'll use those. Uh, but the other thing with epoxy, uh, 100 grits about all you need to get to. You don't need to get it super uh, smooth because the epoxy is going to fill it in it actually likes having a little bit more to to grip but uh i'll use the pads uh and you know i'm working on my technique so i don't need to start with 60 grit anymore <laughs> start with something a little better but i, th I think you know generally I'm, I'm starting uh like i say unless i've got something that's been really punky uh so 150 or so mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Huh? It takes a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting a, you know, a, any other finish on there, a lacquer. You're going to have to really do a lot, but that's, that's, that's another neat thing about the epoxy. You just 
you don't need to get it down to that smooth. Anything else, Frank? I need to. What about the inside of the vessel? Sanding that. Uh, I scrape it. And I've got what I try to do. I call it my little cheater sander. Uh, it's a little bitty, uh, I think it's a sorby tool that I can get in as far as you can get your fingers in. So in case somebody wants to reach in, it'll be smooth that far. But generally with the epoxy, it's going to smooth out anyway. Uh, but you still, you got to get it pretty smooth. Uh, I mean, with, a, you know, with one, with an opening like this, it's not as critical with a, a smaller opening. But if you've got a larger opening, uh, one of those that, you know, you can really look in and see, you, you want it to look good in there. And uh, that's another thing I'm, I'm working on. But I've got, uh, actually, I think I bought them from Frank at uh, one of the AAW meetings. What are those spinner things that you can get in with the long neck on? Who makes those? Uh, sanding glove sells them. Yeah, it's the, the self-propelled sanders. I've got a couple of those that I, I'll use uh, with a long handle that I'll get in as far as I can with those. And I, I tell you, I, I just bought a, a scraper from Trent Bosch. You all familiar with him? It's uh, I bought his big scraper, and I've been amazed how well that thing does. Uh, really smooths things out. So I do the best I can on there. It just depends on the size of the opening and how much you can do. Yes, sir. You mentioned you microwave something. <laughs> what was that? When your wife's gone. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, uh, when I get my epoxy mixed up, uh, like I said, it'll be, you know, almost full and I'll get it stirred up. And when you're mixing it, you can see the cloudiness goes away and all of a sudden it's kind of clear into the microwave for eight or 10 seconds at the most, if it's something that big. And when you take it out, it's a little bit warm and it's like water thin. So when you put that on, it becomes part of the wood. It really soaks in as opposed to, thinner. oh yeah, much thinner. And there's a chemical and I can't, I was talking with Frank earlier about this. I can't remember the name of the chemical, but if you add, if you got 10 ounces, you add 5% of that, of this chemical to it. And it does the same thing. Uh, what is it? No, it's not acetone, uh, but it's something that thins it. And I've tried that, but the microwave works fine. Uh, the only downside, the microwave gives you less pot time because you're, you're speeding up. But it's, yeah, but it's not that quick because uh, you're only just warming it up, but it really thins it. Uh, it does set up quicker. I mean, you got to get on with it. But with this amount, putting on one of those, that's not a problem. So in five to, minutes you're pretty near done. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're, you're moving right along. For example, that, that uh, California you had here when you were home, when you're, you're putting the epoxy on the inside, how do you make sure, since you're putting it sideways over here, how do you make sure you get a good coat on the bottom? You mean down here? Yeah. Well, what I'll start doing is actually pour it in. And then, you know, I'll swish it around some, then put it on there, and then start with the brush. And that's easy. It's, it's trying to make sure you get it up here is, is the fun part. It doesn't pull down the larger huh? area? It doesn't pull in that larger area then? Oh, no, no. As it's turning, I mean, it's flattening out. Okay. If you feel inside here, you can see how, you know, it's flattened out. This one isn't particularly smooth, uh, but yeah, I'm working on things. But it's covered everywhere. Yes. Tell me about the dye that you use. I know one of the guys in the club tried an alcohol based dye with epoxy. I have not done that, but the dyes are very effective, as you can see. <laughs> uh, these, I'm not sure exactly what they are, but they are uh, pigment dispersion. Uh, it's, it's not an alcohol, it's, very, it's kind of thick stuff uh, but I know the, the al alkaline dye you're talking about or what aniline dye. Alan aniline dye yeah uh, I've, I've never messed with that and not not with the epoxy I've never tried to tint the clear epoxy I've only 
tinted the filler stuff. But you could, you can tint it. I understand there's something you can put in that will make it glow in the dark. Why you want to do that, I don't know, but I, you, can, you can do it. We had a, uh, I worked with another fellow up in uh, Tampa named uh, Chip Darnell who started a company called Barn Works and he's been making, you know, barn tables and all that. And some guy came up with a great idea. It was this wormy cypress and he filled all these holes with stuff with this glow in the dark stuff. And it's just, it's neat, but it's not a good idea for me anyway. Anything else? John, do you do any, uh, uh, any uh, custom finishing for anybody? You... Custom finishing? Like yeah. doing epoxy finish for somebody? You, you do on a contract basis. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'll do anything <laughs> within reason if I like doing it. I had a, a, a friend of a friend said, hey, you need to go talk to this gal named Sue. She wants a barn door made. Oh, I make barn doors. Okay. So I went out and I met this lady, very nice lady, and she was remodeling her house and they were going to move the entrance to their bedroom to where it came into the living room. She wanted a eight foot by 40 inch barn door. I can do that. What wood do you want it made out of? And she walked me into another room and pointed at a cedar chest that had been her ha in her family for 150 years. And it came out amazing. I, I, was, I, I made it look like it had, you know, a real pattern that, that you know, and I, I told her when I said, you're, you're kind of nuts, but you found the right guy. <laughs> so, you know, I, I do those kind of fun things. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if somebody needs some help finishing, I'm glad to, glad to share. I mean, if Phil Molthrop can tell me some of his secrets, I can certainly share and pass them on. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go see if I can wash any of this stuff off. Let's go hang out with the Times people. Thank you. Die is nasty stuff. <laughs> Pay attention, or I'm going to say something bad about it. First of all, you, you got to you got to hand it to Chet. I mean, can you imagine taking a piece of wood this expensive, sticking it in the lathe, and then jabbing a tool in there? Huh? It came out beautiful, didn't it? And uh, <coughs> bowl, nice, <laughs> colorful. So this is the jacaranda. Is that what it is? Where's Where's Dave? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you you got to appreciate the the creamy qualities of that wood. You know you wouldn't think so, but it's just great. Here's another one. Here you left a little bit of bark on, and uh, the finish is very good. Uh, Steve Johns is uh, still trying to emulate uh, <coughs> Rudy Lopez. He's getting better, getting better. But uh, with the rosewood, you can really get some interesting patterns going in there. And that, that's what this is all about. You know, you can put that on a shelf and stare at it for days. Uh, what else we got? Ah, look at this. Nice little burl piece. Pretty. Yeah, kind of reminds me of a chamber pot. <laughs> okay, and we talked about this before. Okay, Tom. All right. I don't need that.